as I said, the main question that they had during your particular talk today was what are the main security risks associated with IoT devices and how can they be mitigated to protect a brand? So hopefully the tech guys like yourself can work with the marketing and commercial teams and I think I lost you. There you go. I'll unmute myself. I, I'm muting myself. Sorry. Sorry. Um, next up, we have Angelo D'Amato. Um, Angelo is a cybersecurity expert with over a decade of experience across different sectors and in international cybersecurity organizations. Angelo collaborates with IoT manufacturers through his current role at UL Solutions, as his uh, role is lead principal. I understand here, Angelo, that you're going to be presenting your topic of red cybersecurity requirements and regulatory landscape. So, Angelo, our final speaker for today, please, this is the uh, studio is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much, Elliot. So, I think that uh, the speech will be a little bit uh, with. Uh, a continuation and maybe I'll drill down more on the red uh, that was introduced by by Jose. So it was an interesting, uh, uh, how to say, uh, exposition of all the standards that are uh, available for manufacture today. So before starting, uh, before starting, Elliot, I think that I want to uh, connect a little bit with your point. Uh, regarding the existence of policy, because yes, policy and standard never stop hacker, and they will never do. Uh, but uh, the importance of having a policy and a structure uh, is also to avoid fines and to increase the protection to consumer and uh, increase the awareness for consumer and increase the awareness for manufacturer that security is not only a a cost or a burden, but is an opportunity uh, to have a more cybersecurity ecosystem. So uh, let's just uh, go uh, over the presentation. So I will present the common challenge and pain point. And of course, uh, I'm working in a company uh, uh, testing inspection and certification lines like the one of Jose. So they are competitors company, so DECRA and UL Solution. And I'm Italian and moved in the Netherlands 2016 to work for UL in uh, testing inspection and certification domain. Um, today, I will uh, just want to provide you with uh, an overview of the uh, cybersecurity landscape. I will go very fast since it was also introduced by uh, Jose, I will just uh, complement some of the points with some uh, key uh, uh, message that I want to provide today. Um, the core of my presentation will be on some challenges that we have around the first uh, regulation that will be on the market for product, or the red, uh, and I will drill down in this challenge during my presentation. Um, I will provide you with some observation that we had as UL solution when we were doing our evaluation. And then, of course, some key takeaways for the audience. Um, let's just start with the uh, uh, the first part, that is the EU uh, cybersecurity regulatory landscape. Before skipping uh, into uh, the relation and the graphical relation between all the regulation, I want just to make a point that uh, in um, in Europe, as per today, we have something that is called the C mark that was also touched by Jose. Uh, the C mark is a, a kind of mark that is ensuring that is a, that is a, uh, making sure that the customer they are buying that product, they, they know that the product is safe. So imagine that you as a customer, you are going to buy a phone with a C mark. You are pretty much sure that that phone that you are using is not exploding in your face while you are speaking or catch fire. And so all the safety part is already covered by the regulation and also by manufacturer as a must have. And also the consumer, everybody of us expect that they, they are not a danger for our safety. 
Now with this new regulation, the RED, Radio Equipment Directive, things are changing a little bit because now not only safety uh, or uh, interference with signal and so on are considered, should be considered by manufacturer, but uh, the security will be a must have also for manufacturer. And uh, this will be an incentive for manufacturer to integrate the cybersecurity requirement and to be a little bit more uh, thorough in integrating the security requirement within their product and will help also to educate more uh, the consumer to not think only about safety, but to also think about the cybersecurity. Okay, so let's just be quick. I will be quick on this slide because this is a kind of slide that I put together to show you what are the relation between uh, all the uh, newly uh, upcoming cybersecurity regulation in Europe. It's pretty, it's pretty new. And uh, I just clusterized, did some cluster on the product. You can see on the top that I uh, separated the product in uh, the, uh, the uh, I, I separated the, the, the standard width on the left, voluntary and mandatory. It, it means if the regulation is mandatory or voluntary for the type of application and also what, uh, what is covering. So product or services, process, infrastructure and entities. Let's start with the first piece of regis legislation around cybersecurity on the right, the NIST directive. The NIST directive is a law, is a directive that is covering uh, critical infrastructure, important and essential entities. And uh, in October 2024, uh, there will be the activation of the NIST 2 uh, directive that is an update of the NIST. But you cannot have a secure infrastructure uh, if you don't, if also the device that are in your infrastructure are not secure. And this is the reason why the uh, European Parliament in January 12, 2022, decided to activate the RED uh, requirement for cybersecurity with the RED DR 2022-30. And this will be made mandatory uh, to manufacture to integrate cybersecurity requirement in their product from August 1st, 2025. And the harmonized standard, the harmonized standard is a, is a kind of standard that manufacturer can follow to implement the requirement in a, in a more predictable form. Uh, and this will be available on 3rd of August, 2024. Um, then uh, in the future, in the, uh, in the recent, in the recent future in uh, around 2027 like jose also said that there will be a new regulation that will repeal or will live together with this the, the red that is covering not only the device itself with radio equipment but is covering also software in general the cyber resilience act and this is very very important for you to keep uh, an eyes on to understand what are the evolution of course, we are no, all know that we need to be aligned with the general data protection regulation from uh, 25th of May 2028, uh, eight, 18. And then you have at the bottom of this slide, uh, the Cybersecurity Act. The Cybersecurity Act is a framework for the from the uh, European Union that is uh, consisting on voluntary certification scheme. And the first uh, scheme was launched on January 31st, 2024 of this year, that is the EU CC. In the future, we will have also the EU uh, CS for cloud, cloud security and EU 5G for 5G and so on and so on. This is just to give you an overview of where we are, what, what, what is coming up. I want just to show you with you a nice publication from Erosmart. If you want to go into the detail, this is a publication that was uh, published on 21st of May uh, 2024 that is uh, giving you a little bit of an overview of what are the standard, what is their relationship, and many more information that would be helpful for you to, to give a look to understand what is happening now on the market. Okay. In this slide, uh, I want just to give you a kind of relation between this, some of the standard regulation. Um, and of course, I want to give you, as Jose said, a pivoting point on HCEN 303645, that is the standard de facto for consumer devices. 
and can be used as a standard to um, to homogenize the to 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 make it easier for manufacturer and conformity assessment body like QL or DECRA to do the evaluation and to guide the customer towards a, a conformance against UK PSTI, against the Radio Equipment Directive, and against the future Cyber Resilience Act uh, regulation. So here, this is a diagram van, and you can see uh, the, the application of this uh, of the standard. UK PSTI is very small because there are only three, four requirements like uh, as showed by uh, Jose. So, you should not have default password. You should not. You should have a vulnerability disclosure policy, support period, and a vulnerability disclosure policy, and so on. Uh, then, of course, the Etsy is the instrument that you can use to comply towards the UK PSTI. Uh, and then you have, of course, the Radio Equipment Directive that is extending a little bit some of the concept, including. Uh, um, more asset like financial asset and privacy asset, uh, and financial asset that are not considered in Etsy 3645 because it's very generic. And then you have the future uh, Cyber Resilience Act that will be uh, very horizontal, will cover not only the product, but also uh, remote data processing, part of the uh, cloud infra infrastructure from where you process data mobile application that is working with the, the the application and so on. And this will be a really game changer for, for the market. Uh, this is the timeline. I don't want to go into the detail, but I want to precise that the, uh, the standard will be available 30 of August 2024. Um, but uh, the standard was published, the first uh, draft was published in August 2023 from Sensenric. Uh, the standard, unfortunately, was rejected uh, from the European Parliament with the House consultant because it was not uh, repeatable. The test there were some problem with with, with the, the 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 repeatability and with the legal defensibility of the of the of the standard. Then, uh, since then, uh, working group eight, which I'm also part of and also DECRA is part of, worked hard and then provided on. Um, middle of May, at, uh, the 10th of May 2024, the new version that has submitted for the second vote. At the end of the, uh, 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 on the 2nd of August, a little bit earlier than 13th of August, we will know if the standard will be accepted in full, will be accepted partially, or will be rejected. And um, based on the outcome of this, uh, this vote, we will know how to guide better manufacturing and how the manufacturer can uh, apply the conformity assessment. But of course, that standard is not that it will be thrown away, these harmonized standards. Manufacturer can still use, uh, but the only problem is that if the standard is not published on the official journal, they are forced to go through a notified body for the, um, for the, um, the EU type certification. So module B and C. Um, but if there will be an harmonized standard, so it will be voted and accepted the standard on 30 August, manufacturer can do all by themselves without even uh, including a notified body like QL or DECRA. So this is the difference, and this is the reason why it's important uh, the public the the acceptance of the um, uh, of the harmonized standard. And of course, the application date is 1st of August 2025. Let's see. With the, let's start with uh, the first problem that we see that there is uncertainty on scope of definition. So the scope, I will not go into the detail. This was already covered by Jose, but I just want to give a few words. So the medical devices are outside the the scope. It is in scope only if your device in, uh, integrate uh, radio equipment, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and so on, and is internet connected. And so you apply Article 3.3D protection of that protection of network. Uh, then, if your device process personal data and traffic data or location data, Article 3.3E is applicable. So you need to protect that asset. And if your device is also managing money, transferring money, you need to apply Article 3.3F. And uh, there is another case, even if the the radio equipment, so the, your device that has Wi-Fi and so on, um, doesn't is not connected to internet. If uh, your device will be sold to kids, 
is addressing to childcare, uh, so is, is part of the childcare in 2029, 48AC, or is a wearable that you put on your body, that ne you need to apply Article 3.3E for sure. So this is the, the, the point. Another nuance is that if you apply uh, Article 3.3E, for sure you need to apply, uh, mo in most of the cases, also Article 3.3D. It is internet connected, of course. Um, the scope of the standard is only of the device itself and the component that are in the device. Whatever is outside the device, cloud associated services is not under the scope um, uh, of the regulation itself. But of course, manufacturers are responsible for what is happening anyway for their devices. Not that they need to close their eyes, it's outside the scope of that, because the manufacturer remains still responsible of uh, the ecosystem that is around the device. So I want just to clarify that point because it's also explained in the Blue Guide 2022. Um, in this harmonized standard, that is the PRN 18031 that will be uh, published on 30 of August 2024, there are three types of assessment, conceptual, uh, documentation review, gap assessment, understanding that your documentation is in line, functional, complete an assessment, understanding that your documentation is complete and cover all the assets, functional and sufficient access is a light penetration test. You need to check that the function is existing or not and is adequate. Uh, this new standard is not really about being really, like I said, it's not, it's not involving deep penetration test and so on but it's just, is more focused on documentation. So this will push manufacturer to document more the, the device. And this is one of the pain points that I want to uh, cover later. Um, here is just what you can find in your house. And it's an exa a scoping example. You have cloud associated service, we learn outside the scope. So at least for the application of the regulation, and that's it. Uh, in, in your house, you have also a, uh, home router, that will be in scope. Mobile application, not in scope, but of course, like I said, the manufacturer is still responsible for what is happening there, if it's impacting the device. But from a low perspective, it's not covered by the, uh, the, 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 the red at the moment. It will be covered in the CRA in the future. So this is the reason why manufacturers need to be careful for what is happening next. The gateway, of course, is included because can be indirectly connected to internet. There is a problem that happened. Uh, in, for example, there is ambiguity in if a doorbell with a Zigbee connection to a gateway is in scope or not. Um, we had a different conversation. It's not explicitly mentioned in, into the, in the Armazi standard and so on. There is a little bit of ambiguity. Um, I had also many conversations with Ben Cox, that is the convener of Working Group 8, uh, and he, he had the same doubt, but of course, uh, um, he suggested that even if it's not explicitly mentioned that a door lock with a Zigbee or a light bulb with a Zigbee is, connect, uh, is in scope or not, manufacturers should take the high ground because in the future, this will be discovered. Uh, so the scope or not or, or will be um, discussed in a lawsuit. <laughs> so <laughs> and we don't want to find this uh, in, in a bad way. It's better that you do the risk assessment, check if your device harm the network, if your device has uh, personal data or not, or handle financial information, then that's it. You, you need to have, uh, you need to demonstrate that you did your due diligence. So assume, assume your, your due diligence. So what are the challenge? What is the guidance on internet connected radio equipment? There is no publication that shows what does it mean internet connected or go in depth on the definition. And we have many customers to say, is, is our device in scope? <laughs> you need to check a little bit the uh, the context, the scope, the intended use, and it's not easy like yes or no. Most of the case, yes, it's easy to understand, but some of the cases are very challenging and needs a more uh, in-depth uh, understanding. We have a lot of customers that they don't even know if they manage personal data because there there is also a little bit of ambiguity. What does it mean traffic data, location data, or uh, because like like also in previous pre uh, presentation, there is a lack of documentation on what is a personal data and, and so on. So that was also highlighted in previous conversation and previous presentation. Um, now the problem with the manufacturer, at least in the consumer domain, is that 
security is always thought as a, is always a, a, an afterthought because a manufacturer consider for now security still as a, a nice to have and not a must have with this new regulation there is a change of mindset and will and will help also to um to to the manufacturer within the industry to align on the minimum baseline of security level that the man, uh, manufacturer should respect to enter in the EU market so uh like i said there is a kind of reactive approach this reactive approach is also uh generated by the fact that customer they don't uh have a good documentation in place. We saw in many cases that the, there are some of some excellence that they have everything documented, processed, and so on. But we found also many of the customer on the consumer domain that they still have a challenge to maintain this uh, in, the, in in a right way. And then, of course, if you don't have a, docu a strong documentation, you can have hidden functionality. Uh, you can have this connection between different people that they look at the same thing. And so this is the reason why it's important. And with the new regulation and to apply the C mark also for cybersecurity, you need to go through the step that I show here on the, on the six steps. So you need to identify the directory as a manufacturer. You need to, uh, to check what requirements are applicable for your product. You need to check if you need an independent conformity assessment. So you need to involve a, a notified body or not. Um, in case you don't apply or an RMIZ standard is not applied, you have to. You need to go to DECRA, you need to go to UL to, 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 to do the, the, um, the EU type of examination module B is called. Uh, then, of course, the manufacturer has the responsibility to draw up uh, the technical documentation. This is the point that is lacking now for cybersecurity. And then, of course, they can create their declaration of conformity. Another gap that I see here for manufacturers is the fact that they lack about a cybersecurity risk assessment. I saw some of the risk assessments that are done only by one person. <laughs> and then, unfortunately, cyber, the risk assessment is a multi um, so you need multiple people involved legal, you need the technical, you need your management, you need the PM, you need multiple people. And so, uh, and now this is not really happening uh, in a consistent way within organizations. So this will be a big gap because the uh, regulatory framework uh, wants and forced manufacturers to implement a risk-based approach. But this risk-based needs to be documented because if something happened, uh, the market surveillance uh, can ask to the manufacturer to show, okay, well, where do you have your risk assessment? What did you do? Why did you make this choice? Why did you implement or not implement this security control? And the company, the manufacturer needs to be able to demonstrate their due diligence. If there is no diligence, there is a fine or the product will be recalled by the market or um, the, the, the European uh, Commission can ask uh, the manufacturer, the, the, the member state, not the European Commission, the member state can ask to the, to the manufacturer to uh, fix the issue, recall the product and so on and, and apply the, the fine. Of course, to do all this, you need to check what is your asset, understanding what are your threats, vulnerability, type of attack, risk, understanding your obje security objective, requirements, and all the countermeasures that you applied. And you need to follow all these steps to make sure that your product is um, implementing due diligence and, do, and you have all documented if something happens. So, and this is a proactive approach. So. Uh, legislation is just triggering and, and, and enforcing the manufacturer to have a more proactive approach. It will take time. It will take time, like always. And so, um, and but this is where we need to go to have uh, the, the same reason. Like I said, there is an inconsistent also documentation readiness. If there is a DRM standard will not be published and you are not following a um, testing practices, the problem that have a notified body is to accept different input because it's easy to understand that if you give me a structured input, so it means that you have your design document structured as you want without the, the uh, following a checklist. And if you provide me a structured input that is following a, a testing guide or, or, or an harmonizing standard is different to the, the outcome because it means that an unstructured input me as a notified body, we, we, we as a notified body, we have more work to do. And so it would be more expensive. 
if you are providing me with something that is uh, following uh, a specific procedure, it's easy also for me to check the consistency, to check the documentation and so on. Um, and so it will, of course, uh, the, the evaluation of the, of the test report. One of the approach that we had um, until now, since, uh, and until uh, the harmonized standard, the final harmonized standard will not be published, is to follow the LCTS 103.701, with a few changes to adapt the approach to RET. And this was also presented by by Jose. So I will not go into the details, uh, uh, and uh, but I want to just to catch my last uh, uh, minutes also to go through the observation from you that is also important for me is practical and that to and, and to leave you with some next step so we did we did a kind of survey in UL because we are we we are uh, in UL we we did many at C3 under 3645 evaluation many gap assessment for red so far and we have also our internal proprietary uh, uh certification uh um certi pro private certification that is called MCV 13 um, 1,366. Uh, this is the what we called IoT rating that has different layer, but this is probably. And I, we ask uh, to the evaluator, what are the things that you saw most frequently that the customer has problem with? And we saw that the uh, the the part that the customer had more problem was about keeping the software updated. So uh, there was a lack of uh, uh, of of um, digital signature on, on the on the on the firmware anti rollback measures that were not implemented and and there was no um, risk assessment um, the process was not documented and there was of course no minimum support period but now with the UK PSTI we already see that. The, Manufacturer will get used to, <laughs> and will will be forced to define a minimum support period. So me as a customer that I'm going to buy a product, I need to know for how many years the product will be updated for security. It's not that I buy the product and then one month later the, the manufacturer can say, okay, we are not maintaining anymore uh, the the security of the product itself. So I need to be aware. Um, then of course uh, there is the there was a huge problem because not many customers they had the um, vulnerability disclosure policy. This is another point that will uh, is enforced by UKPSTI, and the main point that they had the problem with is to um, show a software composition list. They are not maintained. They were not maintaining it, and this is the reason why this is a key point for the. Um, USA cybersecurity labeling scheme in in, in USA uh, that is voluntary, and in Europe with the CRA is also important. So please keep uh, um, in mind that. Of course, another point that the customer had problem to, with is to understand how to demonstrate that, that they validated input. And since there was not not really a, an activity like a threat model. Uh, evaluation of the attack surface for malice was difficult to demonstrate this point for many of our customers. Um, imagine that we had also, I remember that we had a testing on a device like um, infotainment system and uh, and um, and one of the input was the, you know, that when you connect to a Wi-Fi, you have the SSID. Uh, we were able to inject uh, the to inject uh, text with the SSID, executable text with the SSID, because the infotainment system is showing that SSID on a each type of HTML page, and and we were able to do a cross site scripting there. Um, uh, so I think that is important also to understand what are the, the how to think like an anchor and to and to find this case. Um, and then, of course, like I said, this is also connected with the validate input uh, data. They they were not able to explain how they minimize the exposed attack surface. Uh, action and key point. So to be on time and to and to provide some time also for questions. Uh, what we are uh, saying and what we are suggesting to manufacture is to have an established uh, risk assessment product, risk, uh, cybersecurity risk assessment for their product, formalized, and uh, 
and justify all the decision that they are taking to apply or not a security requirement uh, to guarantee the legal defensibility if something happened. Like I said, a policy never stop an acre, but it will make you stronger towards uh, uh, fines or, uh, or or towards uh, or to demonstrate that you are what you did was legally defensible and that you you, you did what a reasonable person will do um, being a manufacturer of that specific product. Uh, at sitting under 3645, like we said, and like also you just say, say it is a very good starting point towards uh, a compliance on, uh, on, on the future harmonized standard. And of course, there is a delta. We will see what will be this delta when the standard will be published. You can use the uh, official uh, assessment specification of SCT 13605, like the 103701. And uh, we suggest to use also the ICS and ICSIT in a more formal way, eh? because this will help you towards a formal approach with RET that is needed. Um, and then uh, don't wait that uh, last minute, because if the harmonized standard will not be um, if the harmonized standard will not be published, will not be approved in full uh, by 30 of August 2024, uh, all the manufacturers to sell their product in Europe, they need to go through a notified body. So you will end up with a long line of waiting. So engage with a notified body as early as possible. So this is a suggestion. And uh, if you don't know how to create your test report, and do your assessment, engage with, with not only with a notified body, but with a third party conformity assessment early in the process to, to make sure that you are ready when the uh, the regulation will be enforced. With all this, uh, I think that uh, my presentation is over and I will give a leave also some time for question and i like to finish on time. Thank you very much, Angelo. Very informative as well. I'd like to thank everyone today. We've uh, gone through the whole aspect of uh, cybersecurity with a, a, a big magnifying glass on the Internet of Things for the afternoon. Regulations, of course, are very, very key. Policy documents are available out there. I'm sure after today, the information will be shared to the group. I will allow Sarah to close us off for today. Um, for you, though, my my question, Angelo, what do you think is the most important first step or process to look at before you're spending money to go to an outside consultant for a risk assessment? What do you think are the things that any organization can do without or to check for vulnerabilities, to do some ethical hacking, for instance? What, what suggestions would you make? before somebody goes to maybe a Deloitte or a consultancy and spends money for this type of assessment? Uh, it depends. So to understand what is the risk of your device with the market. So there are some of the devices that are safety critical. Imagine a door lock. You don't want that right. somebody uh, is abusing right. your door lock and be on the news. Maybe you are a coffee yeah. machine. Maybe a coffee machine is a less risk than a, an IP camera that is used by a police station. So I suggest to start with the intended use of the device, understanding what is the level of risk, understanding what is your risk appetite, and uh, and that is the first step for sure. And this is the reason why it's the first step of the risk assessment, so that is important. But good question. For me, the evolution of the internet um, isn't just the devices that are being kept. Now we have, as you mentioned, wearables is the newest. I'm sure the, the goggles are coming very, very soon. Um, in car screens, for instance, navigation units, I'm sure are going to be prevalent. Working for Huawei as a technology company, we were always asked in the past, can we just provide security on layers three and layer four? Because we're just looking at the network and the transport layer. But now with layer seven is the application layer that everyone's mostly interested in. We've got to look at vulnerabilities in all of the OSI model layers, of course. And that's become very, very clear. Um, storing that data, of course, as well, um, has been one of the biggest topics that we had in the morning. Uh, what data do you store? How do you store it? Where do you store it? And of course, what do you store in a fridge or a device, for instance? What information do you want there? As you mentioned before, 
changing the HTML code, for instance, on a Wi-Fi device. Most people would put the name of their home, for instance. Will people continue to put their identities on the homes or will they change that into uh, asterisks for encryption, for instance? I mean, there's there's a lot of things that people can do for a little bit more of awareness and protection or protections for themselves. Sarah, over to yourself, if you'd like to take over. Thank you very, very much, Angelo. Been appreciative, thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ear, for leading such an excellent and interactive event. Okay, so I would like to thank everybody, all our attendees, sponsor, speaker panel, and especially our moderator for the for their contribution and the knowledge for the presentation. So we will see you again at our upcoming physical event. Till then, thank you all and goodbye.